Hi everyone. It is my pleasure to have you join us today for the XPRIZE Connect Future of Learning Lab. My name is Brianne Ward and I'm the project specialist for the XPRIZE Connect team. I'm truly honored to introduce this dynamic panel of thought leaders dedicated to empowering others. Today we'll talk about the power of gaming and the impact of games as effective tools in learning resilience, forming social communities, and the potential of video games to motivate and create transformative experiences in learning, health, and social-emotional development. In 2020, we have seen a worldwide epidemic crumple our economy and hold the lives of millions of people and ultimately change our proximity to one another. James Conigle predicted in 2010 that if we reach a critical mass of gaming hours, we can solve the world's biggest problems like climate change or poverty. And it's estimated that 2.6 billion players play hours on end to save virtual worlds today. So I'll raise the question, why are we not further along in using games to address issues like mental health? This panel of experts here today are all working on using games to empower people to build skills in virtual worlds they can apply in real life. I'll begin with introducing each of our panelists who will tell them a bit about their work, and then we'll jump into a discussion exploring the potential of gaming and social emotional health. Dr. Keisha Waddell is the executive director for the Center for Blockchain Studies, where she supports the applied understanding of new and emerging technologies. Dr. Keisha Waddell, welcome. Oh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and I am so pleased to be a part of this inaugural experience with uh, XPRIZE. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about um, the Center for Blockchain Studies. Studies. We essentially are a, we've called ourselves Where Blockchain Education Meets Wealth Building Opportunities. Um, the Center for Blockchain Studies is the forward-facing education arm of Black Blockchain Consultants, which is a network of uh, blockchain novices and seasoned professionals who collaborate to understand blockchain technology, where it's headed, you know, how we can profit from the $3.1 trillion industry. And um, we basically are trying to recognize, we recognize the power actually, we recognize the power of the, and potential of blockchain. And we are basically using our uh, network to educate, empower, and equip our members for the greatest wealth transfer since the creation of the internet. Um, uh, you might be wondering what blockchain is and how it kind of fits in here. Uh, blockchain is a distributed synchronized database containing validated blocks of transactions. And relevant to this discussion, it's important to note that the strength of blockchain technology lies in its consensus protocols based on game theory mechanics along with peer-to-peer -peer networking and cryptography. Uh, the three work together to enable secure, transparent, immutable, reliable, and validated transactions of uh, value on the internet. Uh, transactions uh, that are of a digital na na nature like uh, photographs and video songs, currency, and even academic credentials, or even of a intangible um, asset type like patents and trademarks and intellectual property and then even as well as real assets like real estate property gold art and that's all once it's tokenized to represent uh, a symbol of ownership backed by a legal system but anyway it's all made secure and honest by the incorporation of cryptography and game theory and game theory uh, works to incentivize the collaboration of of good behavior and an, of anonymous nodes that are distributed globally for the common good of the network. So um, in a purely decentralized blockchain network like a Bitcoin that you might be familiar with, cryptography and game theory is critical to making the actions of bad actors not even worth the effort. So that's how blockchain kind of fits in there. But um, beyond my involvement in um, the uh, Center for Blockchain Studies, that is my after my full day job, which is actually being a special education teacher in a public uh, school setting in the suburbs. And um, in my classroom, I am known in my actual district, I'm actually known as 
a person who integrates technology for transformative teaching and learning experiences, which include um, high tech kind of uh, gaming kind of things that I bring into my classroom and learning experience to just uh, reimagining, um, you know, normal kind of games or gaming techniques in the classroom just to deepen my students' understanding. So um, I look forward to speaking with this this esteemed panel of uh, folks uh, who I know have experiences and they're probably tools that I would love to use in my classroom, to tell you the truth. So I look forward to that discussion. Thanks. Next, we have Rosemary Lockhurst, who is a writer, technology entrepreneur, and award-winning game producer. You may know her from her work on Shadow's Edge, multiple award-winning mobile game as the producer and narrator. She's helped young people find their inner ninja. Thank you for joining us, Rosemary. Thank you very much for having us here, and I'm honored to be amongst these ladies. Um, to go a little bit deeper into what we do with Shadow's Edge, um, we help young people that have had some kind of hardship in their life, be that a chronic illness or like now with uh, with what's going on in the world, COVID and others, build resilience through our game. The game is based on narrative therapy and on artistic expression. And it's an adventure game where you have to save a city that has been hit by a storm. And you do that by answering therapeutic questions that you find in the game and by painting, spray painting um, in the game and sharing your art with others in a safe community. So the game is free. We're a nonprofit and we just want to help as many young people as we can to build strength and to build emotional resilience. Amazing, amazing work. Next, joining us today is Jessica Murray. She is the CEO and co-founder of Wicked Sank Studios, a media company designing crazy fun interactive story games that happen to prompt behavior change and real world action. So happy to have you here with us, Jess. Hello, hi everyone. Um, it's so great to be here uh, with XPRIZE and with these fabulous women around me. Um, so a little bit more about Wicked Saint Studios. So like you said, we create interactive story games that are wickedly fun and actively good. So get out and change the world good. And so and within our interactive story games, you're able to practice playing the hero and dealing with conflict. And then we'll prompt you to actually do something in real life. So you get to play the hero and then become a hero in real life. Um, right now, our next game that's coming out that we're currently working on is called Pathways. So imagine uh, Riverdale meets Game of Thrones, and that's what's happening in Pathways. So again, interactive story game on your mobile phone, um, hopefully be available for young people very soon. It's a young episodic adventure game. And um, all of our um, all of our games are really based on um, conflict. And that's because uh, my partner and I, we've spent the last seven years in peace building. And I do social change communication training. So that's where I'm training young activists all over the world in um, how to create strategic messaging, storytelling, and even gameplay to start shifting attitudes and behavior. And we have what we call the tattoo method, which is all about having an audience-centered approach to really um, uh, how to tap into your audience's identity um, and to so that they identify with your characters and your messages and um, your gameplay. So how to take young people on a real-life hero journey. And that's what we're, um, that's what we're all about here at Wicked Saints. Our last panelist today is Ada Palmer. She's a professor of history at the University of Chicago, studying pre-modern European thought, history books, reading, censorship, and information control. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. Thanks. Um, so in terms of games, that's my kind of other hat from my historian hat, which is my science fiction novelist hat. Uh, 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 being the author best known for the Terra Ignota series. But I've been using gaming both in history teaching and now in science fiction teaching. So for a number of years, I've used text space and face-to-face -face live action role playing to teach history. I'm best known for my uh, papal election simulation, which for two weeks every year fills campus with uh, people dressed in long cardinals robes and wandering around campus with swords and everyone knows it's because they're learning history. Uh, but for the pandemic, the university has approved a project of mine called Exoterra, 
in which I'm creating an online uh, text-based uh, collaborative research community uh, via Discord in which all of the students from across all different disciplines in campus are pooling their research to design a new civilization to be built on a terraformed exoplanet. And so from our planetology and planetary science labs, we have the details about the planets that they're looking at in the new solar system. And all the different disciplines have to pool their resources to do it. So the economists have to design economic systems. The uh, oceanography students have to design the ocean biosphere. The law students have to design the new legal system. And it's allowing all of the students, hundreds of them in many different classes, to do collaborative research toward an aspirational and constructive project, which is building morale and community during the separation of COVID. So a great example of how real research within a gaming sphere can be used to facilitate collaboration and community. All right, thank you all so much. You all do such amazing work. We have some concrete examples of games that can impact learning, health, and resilience from all of you. And so a question for the panel, what do you think is the true potential of gaming for learning social emotional skills? The true potential of games? Um, Rosie, do you want to start us off? Sure. So we had this question when we uh, when we wanted to translate our book into something digital. And we looked at, you know, what can we do to create a, a product that is that is digital and that's comfortable for the next generations? And gaming is just so powerful because it has a few values, I think, within games that you can't really match. And play, for example, has been used for, you know, hundreds of years in psychology. Just nobody has taken it digital so far. And I think just that, that method of really being able to create experiences that people can go through, they can experiment with. You can't really kick your brother under the table, well, at least not more than once, right? But in a video game, you can practice that and you can get better at it and you can take those skills back into real life. And I think that's that's something where gaming has a lot more potential than we see nowadays to really teach people certain things, not just procedures and processes, but really teach them things about themselves and have them experience and practice that. I don't know how you ladies see that. Well, I, I wanted to add to that, actually. Yeah, I know, you know, working with my students who have, you know, clinical um, uh, disabilities, you know, to include the learning disabilities, reading and that kind of thing, I have to say that um, when they are engaged in gaming, they absolutely tap into almost what a sixth sense, I would say. You know, they make sense of what's going on. Um, they, they engage so deeply, which we understand that's where learning even begins. You know, you bring in your existing um, knowledge and you, um, you know, and, and layer on new information. Um, but the biggest thing I see in terms of the impact with gaming, particularly in the traditional classroom setting, and I'm talking K-12, uh, you know, K-12 serves a certain type or or a profile of a student very well. You know, if you think of the bell curve kind of situation, there's that set of kids who are going to do well no matter what. And then, of course, there's a kind in the middle, um, which, you know, they kind of make it, they don't. And then, of course, the folks on the tail end who are just, this is not going to be the right setting. Gaming allows for everyone to show their expertise. Um, and to be what it is they, they want to be in a safe place. As much as a lot of times uh, educators attempt to make their classroom a safe place to, you know, fail, which we know is a part of learning, um, it's not. It's not a safe place, you know. But even, if, even if the teacher, uh, him or he or herself, um, is very, you know, empathetic and, and caring, you know, you got this, the whole set of peer pressure and such like that, that those dynamics that go on in a classroom. So when you're able to take on a persona inside of a game, um, a gaming situation and this and I'm, I'm not even really just referring to a digital space, but just even when you're able to role play and really take on a persona, whether it's digital, you know, offline or online, people really get into it. I mean, I, I see how people change behaviors just at 
you know, at Halloween time, when they're able to put a mask on, they become a whole nother person. You, you know what I mean? Um, are you, do you see, do you see that kind of um, behavior, uh, Ada? Like on your In the classroom? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on the campus. After the role play, exactly. Uh, you know, the, the role play that I do in my uh, Renaissance course is in the midpoint of the class. So they've mm-hmm. already been in class for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Then there's this moment where they take on different roles and they become different people and they have to negotiate and betray each other and help mm-hmm. each other and invade France or not invade France, whatever they decide mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. Afterward, they know each other's names. Yeah. Uh, afterward, the balance of who speaks in the classroom changes yes. totally yes. so that it evens out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot more students who didn't speak before do and the students who were sort of the hyper enthusiastic hyper engaged students tend to dominate the conversation Mm -hmm. uh, instead are eager to hear what their peers want and address more of their questions to each other Mm -hmm. you know oh you were king charles when you did this why did you do it instead of it being between them and the teacher Uh, it's amazing how much and and another great example of this it lingers Mm-hmm. So that oh. this year, as COVID shut the classrooms down and shut the campus down, it was the students who got to know each other through that role-playing game who kept in touch, formed an online community, supported each other, had the emotional and friendship resilience to cope much better than the mm-hmm. students in other courses because they had that experience of having tried together, failed together, planned together, mm-hmm. uh, and accomplished something together or or on down in flames if they were the losing faction Uh, but even that is an accomplishment because of course in a game as i stress to them what your your goal isn't to win your goal is to create an awesome experience for everybody Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. if you're the person who's going to go down in flames that is a great achievement too so long as the going down in flames is exciting and dramatic Oh my gosh, this is so interesting, you guys, because um, in so in peace building, we use role playing a ton. Um, And just in, you know, more to say, like, if you're in the field, like, what would you do in this situation? We also use it for uh, violence prevention training. And so I went to this one violence prevention training where all they, they never told you what to do. They just had you read through scenarios. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what's going on what would you do? And, um, and it's so powerful. And, and again, what you're talking about with experience, like we know that behavior change doesn't happen by giving someone information. Mm -hmm. It happens through experiences. Mm -hmm. And, um, Mm -hmm. and that's something that we can give through gameplay, through stories. And it's one of the reasons why I train storytelling in so many places is that, um, you know, you can kind of vicariously have an experience through somebody else. Mm -hmm. But through gameplay, you can be that main character. You can decide how to respond in a situation and then safely experience the consequences of that behavior. Um, You know, when we're talking about something that's like, you know, real life type of things as well as what, you know, we really address in our interactive story games is like, okay, what do you do when a bully's coming at you? What do you do if a bully is coming at someone else? What do you do if someone's saying something really uh, racist and hateful? Mm-hmm. If you respond in an aggressive way, the chance of retaliation is really high. If you respond passively, you become a bystander and you become vulnerable. But between passive and aggressive, there's all these other ways you could respond. Mm-hmm. And wouldn't it be great if you could practice those responses in a safe environment um, where you can still get that feedback that you need but you don't have to um experience that embarrassment or or being horrified or or paralyzed Mm -hmm. in a moment when it happens in real life and and that's what we found when what led us to interactive story games was actually in the beginning we started with just having a gamified app where it asked you to go and do missions in real life and we found that the youth didn't have um they didn't have the self-efficacy. So they Mm -hmm. didn't believe in their own ability to accomplish their goal. Mm -hmm. Um, And that lack of confidence, so social cognitive theory says that self-efficacy is the number one indicator whether someone will take action or not. And these youth wanted ways to practice dealing with conflict, having these tough conversations, what to do in these situations before being asked to go be a hero Mm -hmm. um, in real life. Um, Mm -hmm. Rosie, do you also find this kind of thing with 
the students that you're working with that like are looking for some kind of experience or or is it something different where they're looking for an escape or something else so i i think because of how we advertise the game in the app store they are trying to, to actively learn something and in our case because it's it's uh, you know mental resilience what they're what people come to us for is self-care or self-help and mm -hmm. so they do know what to expect when they get into the game um, I think one of the things the combination of really being able to immerse yourself in a game such as our game Shadow's Edge where you have a different world different characters they don't really look like humans you know it's there 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 are things that really give you that suspension of disbelief that video gaming can can bring but we then combine that with really proven um, therapeutic processes that take them through what they're going through and actually really teach them something about how they react and mm -hmm. how they uh, process certain situations. Let's say, for example, with COVID now, we've seen a lot of our players really ask these questions about, you know, isolation and how they deal with it. And then we encourage them via challenges within the game to actually reach out to people that takes them back into real life where they also practice what they did in the game, what they practice in the game, and they take that back to their own life. And I think that's something that we see a lot. So they do know what they're coming for. Um, we do give them that that clear experience. And as Ada was saying too, you know, there's a bit of role play in there. We're a first person game, but there's a bit of role play in there because you're the savior of the city. And you have that power to actually make the decisions necessary to save that city and to do that you have to dig deep into yourself and really talk about what you, what you're going through and that that's the basis of narrative therapy that they take back into your life mm -hmm. dr keisha what, how do you see that uh, working out oh you know um i was really just thinking i, I know we we're talking about digital gaming a lot but i, I really I am really what I'm seeing. I, I'm thinking about my daughter, actually, as you guys were talking. She had a, um, a an experience, a collaborative experience in her first year of college where she was supposed to uh, kind of exchange different things with different people who she never met before. Um, I forget what the, it's a very, very um, famous study. I was trying to think of what it is. But anyway, she came. She was very reflective. She realized that she really needed to um kind of, you know, scale up her social skills. You know, she she felt a little um, insecure asking people questions and that was something she wanted to kind of uh, develop. And, and as the game went on, because I guess there were so many of them doing this game that people were starting to get a little more comfortable with people coming up to them and asking for exchange or it's kind of a barter thing or something. I forget how it goes. I'll have to look into that. But but anyway, um, she realizes that she, she started to be a little bit more conscious of her surrounding. You know how, how students and people nowadays have earbuds in their ears all the time and they're not really, they're kind of in their own world. Um, she would have to kind of overhear um, conversations because I guess she had to find certain things. And when she'd overhear different things, she would approach the, the uh, person to talk. And so anyway, that she came away just really feeling like um, she really needed to increase her skills just from that experience. And again, that was a college, a very large, you know, typical lecture study kind of course. And the outcome of it was so much more than just the task. And it really affected her to date. You now she's a second year college student. Uh, but yeah, it's I, I really do see that, um, you know, being able to go into uh, to gamify instruction really allows us to cover so many uh, learning outcomes and necessary skill development that, um, you know, an isolate putting the putting them in isolation just just doesn't happen. You know, there's just mm -hmm. uh, we know the 21st century requires uh, critical thinking skills and all of that kind of thing goes on, you know, goodness, just simultaneously in a uh, gaming situation, um, from what I understand. <laughs> and even with the digital ones, I see how, um, uh, uh, I, I see, I have, I have a set of twins and a lot of times they'll be, 
uh, in their very separate rooms. And they're, I hear them, you know, this conversation going on, but they're not even in the same room, but they're interacting through a game, you know, and it's, it's, it's just interesting to me. So it truly does create, oddly enough, even though they're right there, it does create uh, community. Uh, we have another mm-hmm. girlfriend who's, you know, 52 like myself, and she um, does the came with the words or whatever with other people and I mean, it just it it really does bring in community uh, where you would think it's kind of that that negative um, perception of you know some lonely person in the basement playing games kind of thing it's hardly that it is definitely much more positive yeah. and, and on I, that point mm-hmm. that connects to something I'd wanted to bring up where yes which I think is one of the elements that tends to be undertapped in digital gaming Mm -hmm. uh, and also in what one might call big budget gaming because there's lots of small scale indie gaming that makes use of it, which is Mm -hmm. the power of generating your own words rather than just words. You know, most of the role play that happens in large scale digital games is you get to a point where there's a choice Mm -hmm. and you have a palette of five pre-written answers, the, good answer, the medium answer, the mean answer, and the you can only do this because you joined the cult of the cat god answer, right? (laughs) Uh, And you pick one of those four. And you can have very interesting narrative trees from that, Mm -hmm. but it's a different thing from generating your own words. Uh, Whether you're generating your own words via speech or via text uh, typing. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of games in, and formats that even a very large scale digital game can tap. So for example, a really neat format for a very simple moment within a game is you have people that have characters, they're in a multiplayer situation and something comes where one of them has to make a decision. If one of them is uh, the head of the space agency and just has to decide which character will be the pilot and which character will be the head of the um, mission control or you know, you've come to a place where somebody has to make a decision as to whether to, you know, uh, pass a law or not. Or somebody is the judge in a trial and has to decide whether they think someone is innocent or guilty. And you can then say, okay, there's going to be a half hour timer and we're connecting the players directly to each other to talk, Mm. uh, whether by text or voice, and debate this. And you have to embody your character and say the things you think your character would say in the interaction. And then in the end, a real human being makes a real human decision based on your persuasive efforts. And you've used your own words to do it. And it's an immensely powerful tool in gaming. Uh, People talk about it years later. Remember that time when we were playing the game with the space decision? You know, Mm -hmm. uh, you you do Mm -hmm. see people doing that. And Mm -hmm. we have medical studies as well, which show that there are a lot of different neurochemicals in the brain, but there are some that we associate with fight or flight reactions, sort of stress chemicals, the stress chemicals that are generated by living in COVID, the stress chemicals that are generated (laughs) by uh, trauma or anxiety, the Mm -hmm. stress chemicals that are generated, in fact, by, um, uh, by some forms of action gaming, because when you're doing a really awesome simulator of being chased by terrible monsters, Mm -hmm. your brain is also, in addition to being filled with fun, being filled with, stress chemicals, which can do damage and can linger in your mind a long time after Mm -hmm. you finish playing the game in a way Mm -hmm. that we think might be damaging. Mm -hmm. They've Mm -hmm. they've monitored these chemicals lingering in the brain for up to two hours after playing a game or watching a film. If you Mm -hmm. have a conversation with another human being, they go away in 15 minutes. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Uh, the, The power of just human interaction is so therapeutic. Uh, and so that can be integrated into any game just by making it possible for the human beings to create their own words and interact, whether lo- as the whole game or whether as a small node within a game with many other structures. And maybe if I it may add to that, I think that a lot of these mainstream games at the moment, they go by a certain formula of what a game should be like. Uh, which is a lot of it is, you know, giving people multiple choices, as you say, or, you know, you either do this or you do that. There's there's limited options. Mm-hmm. We've opted to go for a different way where we try to encourage people to uh, create their own diary and create their own narrative and their own story by writing about what's happening to them in real life and then take that experience back into the game and share it with others. And I think 
with with what you said, um, Ada, is mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. powerful if you then through what you are going through and what you are thinking, especially if you're like stressed out or anxious or depressed, mm -hmm. uh, it's very powerful to then connect others through that game in that world that is not as realistic yet as your real life and you can test those things out and you can experiment yes. with them before you actually take you know what you've learned back into your own life and and hopefully start reaching out we've had we've had players that said you know we, i actually did talk to my parents now i've never done that before and mm -hmm. and it's really rewarding to hear that they take things seriously um that have been created in a game right and that they actually came to with their own conclusions yeah. through their own words yeah. And I feel like that's so important. It disturbs me so much when I hear students feel like they have to, uh, they graduate from traditional education. They feel like they now they learn, you know, now they learn what everything uh, means. So, yeah, um, having that connection and that deep connection, uh, um, you know, with one another and with themselves is, is tremendous. Um, and, and I have to say, too, I, I think that is one of the trem um, tremendous ads for gaming is that whole idea of, of choice, you know, real choice. Um, and then particularly in the way you're talking about, Rosie, that, that was, that's really dynamic to uh, make it choice that is outside of the, the just, show, just choosing C as the answer mindset, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, you all have noted um, some amazing points of how gaming um, can fill in gaps where other technology may fail, and particularly within the traditional or mainstream education setting. I wanted mm -hmm. to know what you all think about um, using gaming to support those who have more atypical conditions, those who may fall on the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. or those with um, who may have gender dysphoria and are working through gender fluidity, and how we can use gaming um, to improve and understand um, those those areas and also how we can uh, create more acceptance within those people and going back to this idea of resiliency. Mm -hmm. I think we've touched on it in the sense that games allow for uh, the, the building of empathy, you know, on, on deeper levels. Um, Ada, you just kind of mentioned how when you talk when, when in that study, when people talk with one another, it, the mm -hmm. information just kind of disappears in, in 15 minutes. And I think that's the, because the a stress lot of, chemicals. Yeah. Oh, the stress. Yeah. Oh, the schedule. Oh, the stress. Oh, OK. Disregard then. I'm going to take it somewhere else then. Um, yeah. Well, then. Um, well, what I was, what I was going to get at, well, I misunderstood that, what you said then, but what I was going to get at was um, just the whole idea of uh, being able to, uh, kind of like what we all have been saying, be able to take a situation and, and really play it out without the, the danger of offending someone and what have you. I mean, I feel, I feel like the power of gaming is... Um, likened to the power of music, you know, how music is considered the international language kind of thing. Um, there's much that can be uh, conveyed in a gaming situation. And depending on the, the purpose of the game, um, it, it could be used as quite a powerful tool, in which case, again, um, I feel like we really need to teach people uh, how to evaluate things because, you know, we have we're, we're using games for good, and there might be some really uh, some ideas that we don't want, you know, to get locked in so deeply. But that's we know the power of gaming, and it could go that way and in a negative way. So um, that's where we still need to uh, games also play into making critical decisions and evaluating things so that you can identify, you know, what message is really being sent. You understand what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I think mm -hmm. um, I think inclusion um, and representation and empathy are so important to consider mm -hmm. when um, when building your games. You know, we look at um, when, it, of course, I'm always going <laughs> to go back to like conflict and peace building, but uh, the um, what we tend to do is demonize the other. 
Mm -hmm. And um, when you demonize the other, it makes it easier to harm that person. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, you know, when you feel like you're under attack, it's also impossible to see the pain and suffering of others. Um, And so that's the amazing thing about games and um, more so games. I'm I'm more um, even like the the narrative scope of things is is when you also have a really strong narrative base, you're able to identify um, with some of these people and whether and and you start to form a relationship with these characters, especially if you do the whole character development and they feel real. Mm. Um, and it goes a long way to mm. thinking about, okay, so if you, to have this person who, if they're on the spectrum or um, however they may be different, mm-hmm. being able to see them as a, as a person, being able mm-hmm. to interact with them, to see the ways that you interact with them and how it affects them in their, in their life and, mm-hmm. and, and in their happiness um, is, a, is a great way that we can start building um, empathy and really starting to, you know, maybe you can go play the game in their shoes for a while. And, um, yeah. and, and so it goes across every, every type of difference. And I really mm-hmm. believe that our inability to deal with difference stops us from making progress mm-hmm. on everything we face. And, um, you know, and then uh, the other thing of inclusion is, you know, whether you're creating a messaging campaign or story, people have to be able to see themselves mm-hmm. in it. Um, and if they don't see themselves, whether it's themselves in the language or the imaging or the, how they identify, then that means that, that uh, whatever that is is not speaking to them. You're not speaking their language. And right. so it's so important to have um, this kind of representation within games and so kids can see themselves within mm-hmm. the games and interact. So on kind of both sides of it, whether it's creating empathy for how you treat others or being able to build confidence in who you are and that's okay and seeing yourself represented in games, all those are really powerful um, powerful tools. And again, you go down to kind of this power dynamic that you're talking about, Ada, with, mm-hmm. you know, when people are able to come together and collaborate together and that social um, impact, how how powerful that is with um, contact theory is about, you know, people um, it's, it's not about helping the other, but it's about engaging them as a partner to accomplish something together. And that's when you see a reduction of fear and an increase in empathy. And that's something that these games, um, whether they're, they're social games or you get to kind of, you know, dive into this world and practice stuff. Um, there's so many different elements that I don't think that we've even tapped into all of it that can really help build relationships and and um, lead to more inclusive society if we're conscious about how we build games. I know, Rosie, you. I'm really curious to hear what you have to say with all the work that you've done around um, mental illness and things like that and how you've seen it kind of play out with your players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we do a lot of testing with our players and we do one-on-one interviews with our players. So it's, it's very interesting to hear back, you know, how they perceive certain things. We've had a lot of communication on our in-game platform about what's going on in the world right now with COVID and how that's making people depressed. But also, you know, we've had uh, discussions around suicide or racism in there. And it, it's interesting mm-hmm. to see that um, these young people, they do feel all of that and they do want to learn something about it. It's, mm-hmm. it's more that a lot of, a lot of times it's fear, uh, fear of being ignorant that stops them from actually finding mm-hmm. out more about the mm-hmm. other person. We go one step further even with things, which, which to be fair, we don't do a Shadow's Edge at the moment, but I think that we, we will in, in the future. I think games are uniquely positioned to also have us as game developers as industry and how people play the game and what they play and how long they play and what choices they make and why they make those choices to really potentially in real life be able to help them and support them better as well. So we could also use gaming as a very powerful research tool. Agreed. Ada, how do you see that? Uh, do you learn a lot from what you do in your, if, for example, in your real world role play games or mm-hmm. uh, that you take back into teaching? Oh, lots. Um, I think there are several points I want to touch on in order and the uh, starting with a through thread on uh, inclusion and also disability. Uh, you know, relating to what you were saying and also what Jessica was saying about there being an eagerness among p- young people, especially to learn about inclusion and also an anxiety about how to be sensitive about it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, to give an indication of the degree of this eagerness, uh, you know, I'm disabled myself. I'm a chronic pain sufferer. And a couple of years ago, when I had to miss class for a surgery, I, you know, in front of the class and said, you know, I'm disabled. I'm a chronic pain sufferer. I want to give you a five minute Q&A about it so that you'll understand why I'm missing class. They were so eager to talk about it, mm-hmm. uh, eager for an opportunity to ask about it, to ask how invisible disabilities broadly work, how to be a good ally, mm-hmm. how, you know, mental illness, which is an invisible disability versus yes. di- invisible disabilities that affect the other parts of the body work, that they kept asking questions for the full hour and a half. Uh, and yeah. afterwards, 13 of them came to my office hours to talk about it more. There's so much eagerness to yeah. have yeah. a space to talk about how to be a good ally. Yeah. And gaming can absolutely be that. Yeah. Uh, in a really valuable way, especially when it's cooperative, especially yeah. when there's a team and different people on that team have different roles. Uh, because if, uh, you know, if this is, let's take my ExoTerra project where students are designing a new planet. If there's a team that's the agriculture team uh, and there's a one person on the agriculture team who's a microbiology specialist who knows how the microbes in the soil work. You have to listen to them when it's time to make these decisions, right? They're the expert on this. Uh, Everyone else there does plants or does consumption or something. And if that person is uh, on the spectrum and talks in a funny way, Mm -hmm. everybody wants to listen to them, practices Mm -hmm. listening to them, Mm -hmm. right? They get to speak to other people who really care about them, feel authoritative and be the expert. Uh, it works the same way in the historical role play where, you know, only one person is the king of France. <laughs> only one person is the Cardinal of Milan. They have things that other people need. Mm-hmm. And it means all of the students practice really having a strong reason to interact with a person that they don't personally know mm-hmm. who has mm-hmm. an unusual affect. And the person with the unusual affect has the practice of, oh, my God, everybody in the room is listening to me really seriously and taking me seriously. Nobody mm-hmm. is being a jerk about this. Mm-hmm. It's a very positive experience on both ends of that, enabled by the fact that it's teamwork and everybody has something that they're the only one that contribute to this situation. So it's mm-hmm. been immensely effective in that. I want to talk a little bit about representation as well. Uh, which is another space where, again, when teaching these things, it's very effective. So, you know, I, I'm always making a point of pointing out, for example, when historical figures we're looking at are disabled, because often we hear about famous historical figures like Lorenzo de Medici, uh, but because his disabilities were erased in the 19th century, they tend to still be erased. And when you point mm-hmm. out to students, you know, not only Lorenzo de Medici, but also King Charles of France in the period are both what we would in a modern sense call disabled. Mm-hmm. Everyone is super excited by the fact that these major figures, the King of France, uh, mm-hmm. are in this category and it becomes a group, you know, conversation. That said, in a lot of games where the characters are pre-generated, mm-hmm. there are limits to how much you can represent. Right. Let's imagine you have your your five person squad and you've tried to make them as diverse as possible. They can't cover everything. Uh, And even if they do cover a wide variety of things, the intersectionality won't necessarily be what a particular person is looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, that that you might have somebody who is an asexual uh, black uh, trans woman. Mm -hmm. And that combo doesn't appear like each of those attributes might appear, but they won't be together. Uh, and there are also, this is about future proofing the utility of a game. There are axes of marginalization that we aren't thinking about yet, that have not yet moved into the forefront of discourse that exist, right? But we're constantly expanding how many different categories we're caring about. There's much more conversation now about trans rights, for example, than there was 10 years ago. Think of the equivalent of that a decade from now that we aren't thinking about yet, but that matters to people and will matter. Yes. When you have an opportunity for the person to design elements of their own character, to create part of the backstory themselves and have that backstory matter, not just be in their own head while they go around being a zombie hunter like everybody else, mm-hmm. but to mm-hmm. in, embody those attributes in a conversation with another person, in a set of actions, in something they write, you make it possible for your game to g- give representation to every intersectional combination and even to axes of marginalization that don't exist yet, right? Mm -hmm. And 30 years from now, when we have kids who are genetically engineered and feel anxious about that, and that's an axis of marginalization, which doesn't exist now, Mm -hmm. your game, even if it's 30 years old, can still be powerful and cathartic for that student if you've built in the capacity to have 
some self-generated elements of the characters. Mm. That is a powerful point. Oh, I love it. Um, so there's work to do, it sounds like, in this, <laughs> uh, in this space. Um, but yeah, they, that's entirely powerful. I, I was going to mention how, how, oh, I think I may have started to talk about how powerful it is to take on uh, personas, but but just being yourself in your in your full mm -hmm. self is more powerful, you know. And and you mentioned that Ada, there was a statement you made about uh, the difference between uh, empowered. But it was something you shared with us that really was oh, yes. poignant. Lots of yeah, lots and lots of games offer a power fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of games offer you are the chosen one and you're the only one who can save the world, rescue the girl, the wolf. Yeah. <laughs> cure the disease, but, you know, defeat the dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the special whatever it is, whether it's dragon's blood or whether it's a technology or whether it's just you have protagonismos, right? You have the attribute of being the main character and everything will revolve around you and you will solve it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those kinds of power fantasies are fun. They're narratively powerful. You know, we've been writing them since Homer's Iliad. They're really cool. Mm -hmm. They aren't the same thing as making a person feel personally powerful mm -hmm. so that when they leave the game, they still feel like they discovered a power that's in them. Yes. When you yeah. persuade someone to do something, when your words do the thing, when you were the one who solved the puzzle about how do we make the agriculture grow quickly enough to feed the colony, when mm -hmm. you used your expertise, your unique intervention, mm -hmm. you feel empowered you discover that you are powerful and it's the same kinds of power you wield in real life it's not the in the game i can lift a 50 foot sword and mm -hmm. swing it around and in real life i can't so i'm powerful mm -hmm. in the game but i'm powerless in real life it's mm -hmm. oh i won this game by being really persuasive and by mm -hmm. really knowing my biology <laughs> uh, or i contributed to this team project by being persuasive and knowing my biology, that's true of me in real life too. Yeah. I am powerful. And yeah. you feel powerful as you leave that kind of game. Yeah. Especially yeah. if it went badly. This is the last <laughs> thing I'll add, and then I want to hear what others say, but there are, uh, you know, students come to me over and over. Nothing is more powerful than when they had a plan in the simulation. It totally failed. Mm -hmm. They were defeated. And mm -hmm. then they had to recover. Mm -hmm. And they had to get new allies now that they've been defeated and the other king has won, right? And they have to find the enemies of that king and, and rally a defense and recover from setbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh -huh. they feel so powerful realizing, oh, everything went wrong and then I turned it around. Yeah. And I reached out to people and I figured out the solutions and we came up with a backup plan and it didn't result in the ideal uh victory for us but it ended up in a compromise in which we were okay that yeah. is so powerful and games can generate that the because mm -hmm. if one team wins and another team loses if the story continue and say okay the win was the midpoint mm -hmm. now that your papal <laughs> candidate has failed how are you going to recover and generate a new base of power and defense in the new situation where you didn't win the election in the new situation where you know, the the first colony you tried to build failed and you're building a second colony. That is yeah. so empowering in yeah. a way that no 50 foot sword or giant robot ever is because you mm. have to leave those behind when you leave the game. You okay. don't have to leave behind your ability to recover from failure. And, and truly yeah. that, that's, that's so cool. So powerful. The soft skills yeah. are well transferred. That's, that's, that mm -hmm. really answers how games can build resilience that lasts beyond the gameplay, honestly. I think it's it's less the good games really make it less about power but more about building mastery and autonomy to make the right decisions mm -hmm. and to really you know learn something and become better at whatever you're trying to achieve and that's that's something that is really um unique to gaming versus more traditional um ways of educating i i, I believe you know to have that at, uh, in a playful manner where it's easy, where you can go back and where you can experiment again. Um, that's something that uh, that really resonates, I think. Jessica, you were going to say? 
Yeah, no, it's so interesting hearing you talk about this. This is one of the things that we're currently trying to, we're currently working through with Pathways is that we know from some of the uh, media behavior change, uh, other types of media that we've used um, with our organization before that we had worked with, um, we did use like soap operas and a lot of fiction and um, from comic books and all these different types of fiction. And what we found was that when things were, so um fantasy that there was no way like with superpowers and all this kind of stuff that um people created dissonance between themselves mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. what um what they were capable of and they actually didn't take the skill away and so one of the things that we're building in pathways around this world is like we want the world like it has to be it's little futures so it has to be cool enough where like kids want to be there but mm-hmm. um also has to just be like you have the skills that you have and how to reward some of these different skills so like when we have um so again everything you're saying with like okay like we're gonna you're gonna be able to create the avatar and the main character will reflect you and your backstory and then when you're going in through the games instead of just having choices um you know um one two three we are thinking about how how to kind of do this kind of thing to reflect different strengths of different personalities mm-hmm. and some of these soft skills. And so let's say you have a certain amount of courage points and then you need to spend them on some of these choices. And so we're thinking, okay, you have these three kind of categories of choices. So you have um, you have like the little humor icon because let's say, because wit can be used to cut down someone and to mock someone, but could also, mm-hmm. humor can also be used to de-escalate a situation. Uh, and then you have like the brain icon for those who are a little bit more intellectual, but kind of like quiet. And then you have the action icon, which is like, okay, I want to step in. And you can step into a fight and make it worse, or you can like get people around you to help surround a victim and, and stop it from happening. And then when you have, and then basically reward different types of traits that are powerful in different types of ways. Mm-hmm. So there's not one way to solve mm-hmm. something. So let's say you, you take a gamble and choose a choice. So you have to, so it costs a certain amount of points, but let's say you actually used empathy in that choice. Now we're going to reward you some points back. And then on the back side, you're actually going to have a, um, what you'll have is like your player stats and instead of having a stat that's full of agility and strength and like all this other stuff maybe mm-hmm. we have some stats on like empathy and trust building and like courage mm-hmm. and like some other things so that, that the young and we can actually mm-hmm. say like this is actually your personality that we that we found by the choices you've made and being able to kind of again build this confidence and this sense of identity of this is who I am and who I believe myself to be this is, I believe that I can transform relationships. I can transform society. I believe that I have the power to do this. I have these skills. And um, it's, you know, and again, everything that you're saying, Ada, with like, we will allow most games are you have to defeat the enemy, right? Because mm-hmm. we've been taught. Right. Um, someone has to lose in order for us to win. But the but the way that the world works, it doesn't even actually work like that. Um, I'm, you know, if I call someone a racist, I might win my argument in that moment. But is that person any more likely to want to help me in my cause? Probably not. But that's mm-hmm. the person I need most. And so within our game, we're going to allow you to go down the path of, like, defeat the other person. That's the enemy. Let's try to get them kicked out of school. Let's try to, like, ruin them or, like, whatever. And you're probably going to hate this person and you can go down that path, but then you'll see what happens. And you'll probably actually need that person at the end of the day to solve the mystery, to solve the conflict, whatever it is. And so there's so much um, kind of interesting things that you can that you can go into and you can use. And like we're still play testing a lot of this ourselves. Um, But again, this is how there's so many ways that you can see if you make impact with these games, you can have your baseline testing, but you can also see how choices evolve over time. Um, And then with our game, we're going to be able to, you're going to practice these different types of behavior and techniques without, without it feeling hopefully very practicey, it should feel like entertainment. Um, but build your confidence and then you're going to be able to unlock missions through in real life. And so we're hoping to see that some of this transfers of uh, being more confident to be able to talk about some of these issues and then see when they unlock them, if they will go do them in real life. And I'm really excited to kind of see how, how that all plays out.
Yeah, I have a couple of concrete examples of exactly what you mentioned, which I'd love to say, but I'd love to hear what Keisha wanted to say first. Oh, I think, no, I just wanted to let Jesse go. I think I was talked over her, so you're fine. Go ahead, Ada. Oh, well, you've reminded me uh, in the first of, of two, di- two different things. So just where you were talking about how, you know, in a lot of games, we're very powerful in an adversarial way, but it can be uh, developing other kinds of skills that are exciting. You know, I'm in the middle of running another game right now. It's a tabletop and text-based game. Uh, but it's a really powerful and, and very grim game. But, I mean, the, the players in there, I've had players, you know, literally jump out of their chairs and bounce up and down with excitement. I've had players cry. Uh, yeah. And I have one player who his character has achieved amazing stuff. He's re-engineered his entire country. He's literally turned himself into a god. The <laughs> thing he cares most about, the player, is his friendship score with the character's best friend. Uh, he cares about that so much more than the rest because it's rich and relatable and the best friend character is a very powerful character. He was more excited when he reconciled with his best friend than when he turned himself into a god, uh, which is a good example of how powerful these kinds of stories can be, uh, which relates to a movement within the science fiction and fantasy world, which is sometimes these days referred to as hope punk. Uh, if you're used to cyberpunk and other sorts of punk, hope punk, but we've noticed that there are so many very dark narratives. Yeah. There's so much grim dark. There's so much, you know, yeah. the conspiracy turns out to be worse than everyone thought. There's so many plots <laughs> where, you know, you're learning that there's a some kind of conspiracy. What is it doing? It's doing something terrible. Um, that <laughs> that uh, narratively, it's incredibly powerful and surprising when what turns out to be happening is people are being good. Uh, and I can use some some yeah. famous and some non-famous examples of this, but many people saw the film The Martian. And there's that moment mm-hmm. at the beginning where they realize that they left him on Mars and we have the people at the computer seeing the pictures and they say, well, left him on Mars. With 24 hours to inform the American people of that because that's our legal duty. So better prepare the press conference to reveal that we've left him on Mars. And it's really surprising, right? Because in every other story, they would cover it up. Mm-hmm. Um, Uh, Or in the film Interstellar, where they come upon this Mm -hmm. secret compound and the secret bunker. What are they doing in the secret bunker? It's the good guys, and they're trying to save humanity, a full of doctors and medicine. It's so (laughs) surprising. That's what never turns out to be the case. Mm -hmm. And we're in a point, because narratives have been so dark, that we can tell stories that are more surprising and therefore more yeah. powerful and, and also more accurate by having the opposite. Right? Thank you. And right. there are these observations people make about how we have so many disaster movies where after the disaster, also everybody turns into a terrible person and we have mm-hmm. biker gangs, you know, murdering each other. <laughs> we have so many versions of the trolley problem. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas real life isn't actually like that in real disasters. People tend to pull together pull and together. cook each other right. gumbo and that's help, right. but that's not what we depict. Mm-hmm, in real mm-hmm. confrontations, a lot of people try to make peace and come up with a solution that isn't A versus B, somebody has to go down, that is mm-hmm, cooperative. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Even yeah. when Google was testing the Google cars and everybody's braced for the trolley problem, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone mm-hmm. wants to ask about the trolley problem with the self-driving cars because we're so used to the idea that the universe is going to make us re- make these grim choices. And then they mm-hmm. ran millions of simulations and it was never the correct answer to hit the pedestrian. It just mm-hmm. isn't actually true that that happens. It's mm-hmm. always the better choice to s- protect everybody. That's the <laughs> way the real world turns out to work. But because we discuss the trolley problem so much, because we discuss conspiracy so much, because we mm-hmm, discuss mm-hmm, zero sum mm-hmm. adversarial so much, we mm-hmm. assume the way the world works when it isn't. If we mm-hmm. tell more accurate stories where people are better, mm-hmm. not only is it therapeutic and educational, it's also more exciting narratively. Yeah. yeah. Because it's yeah, what people expect. It's relatable. Oh, yeah, you know, I love oh how you've touched on a uh, preferred future state, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. telling narratives that, like you said, are relatable. And Jessica, I absolutely love that you're working towards creating that preferred future state within your game um, and everything you're doing with your team um, to make sure that you have empathy and you have this idea, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you have this, this space where the player can see um, exactly who they are in the game, 
right? And, and applying that to that narrative, it has brought up about real world consequences and, and what will happen um, that's more realistic, I think is an amazing way to again get into that preferred future state. Rosie and Dakisha, I wanted to give you both the opportunity to talk about your vision for a preferred future state as we're reaching at the top of the hour. Well, you know what? I really wanted to tap right into what Ada said. I'm so glad you brought that whole idea up of changing the narrative, because I do feel like that's exactly what's going on in this moment that we're living in in real life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an African-American uh, woman and, you know, um, I know right now we're we're as a community changing the economic uh, narrative, you know, um, so and uh, we're changing the narrative in a way that is much more empowering. And um, I, I really, really can appreciate what you're saying because I, that's something that I notice in movies and and uh, music. You know, there's just the darkness factor just aids to the fear and everything that's going on right now. So I, that is so empowering. Um, and that, that's one thing that I that was one of our questions was to to think about how it can you know, things can be impactful beyond gameplay. That right there, being able to truly change the narrative for what's really um, the truth about things. It's just not a trajectory to, to hell kind of thing necessarily, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. just have to be. Particularly when I know I'm here and I know most people around me are like me who are more good and looking to do good, you know? You know, so you, that, was, that was tremendous. Yeah, I, I, I'm very, very encouraged by that. And truly, even in my classroom, when I've allowed uh, my students to just, you know, just, add, you know, really be themselves and just, uh, add to a project. It, they they struggle with that because of some of the things you just mentioned, uh, Jessica, about how um, that the opportunities to um, exercise that uh, on a day to day. And you know, students in K twelve setting are in school probably more well prior to COVID in school more than they're with their parents and and whatnot a lot of times. You know, uh, and it has quite an impact on them. So uh, for them to to uh, get into a, a, a have an opportunity of choice and then the choice they actually make is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to see. It really, really is. Um, so, so yeah, very good point, Ada. Great. And so Rosie, your vision um, for a preferred future state within gaming as it pertains to mental health and well-being. Um, do you have any final thoughts there? Sure. Um, so, I think that there are a lot of mainstream games now that touch on the topic of, of mental health, um, like Allah with their suicide scene that they have. There's there's a bunch of them that have characters that have, uh, you know, certain um, traits like depression or other things. I would love to see more of that, but in a more accurate way, because now it, it's always, it's not somebody has depression or somebody's stressed out, but it's, somebody's crazy mm -hmm. um, and it's it's less you know somebody has um, issues and and feels terrible and doesn't mm -hmm. know how to react to things mm -hmm. but it's they're mentally ill mm -hmm. and I think that really being able to portray these characters more accurately when we then do choose those characters that would be something that I'd really love to see more in gaming the other thing is that I think that there's a lot of gamers and a lot of players that want to do something good, and that's a trend really going up. We see that in our game where, you know, so many of our players actually come to us and then want to help us make the game better. Mm -hmm. um, so I would really love it if more of, of not just indie gamers but also bigger games would actually really take that seriously and, and take the input of their players who are wanting to do the right thing mm -hmm. into the game different narratives and, and, and stories around uh, you know real situations I think that we can that we can use more of the real world within gaming so that then it is easier to take what we learn in games back into the real world that would be my my preferred future state if you will agree yes excellent excellent so 
As we reach the top of our hour, I'm so saddened, but filled with such gratitude that I had the opportunity to grace this stage with your brilliant minds um, and to be a part of this amazing discussion today. Um, for everyone in the audience and everyone watching our live stream, I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to follow your work and that we can still continue this conversation because as we've noted today, we, we have a lot of work to do, um, but we're getting there. So if all of you could just share maybe if your Twitter handles or digital spaces you can follow and keep it to debate, um, that'd be a great way for us to close out. Well, I'll start. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn at um, my full name, Keisha um, Waddell. And I'm also on Twitter at Dr. Keisha Waddell. Um, and then certainly you can follow me on uh, Facebook under, with the uh, Black Blockchain Consultants. Uh, for me, it's even easier. Shadow's Edge <laughs> is the name of the game. And around that, there's the .com for the website. You can find Shadow's Edge on Instagram, Facebook, etc. All of those, including the site, will then also lead back to me and to my profile. And we have an, an, a direct email if somebody wants to contact us. That's feedback at shadowsedge.com. And um, you can find Wicked Saints. You can follow us on Twitter. It's Wicked underscore Saints. And then on Instagram, it's Good Saints Studios. Um, so you can find us there. You can find me on both Instagram and Facebook or on um, Twitter as well. Jessica Murray, no space, and it's Murray with an E. <laughs> and, of course, our website, so wickedsaints.studio. And there you can also sign up to beta test our um, pathways for when it comes out. Um, mm -hmm. And everything, every email that goes through there, I'll see. And so, um, yep, please feel free to reach out and or sign up for our pathways game. You can find information about all the things I do at adapalmer.com. Uh, you can find my history information via University of Chicago's History Department. You can find my novels, starting with uh, To the Lightning, which is the first volume, T-O-O, -O, as in too much, too like the lightning, first volume of Terra Ignota. I also have a blog, exurbe, E-X-U-R-B-E dot com, where I blog about uh, how history works. The most recent post is a set of uh, healthy work habit and self-care guides customized for COVID, which mm -hmm. I produced for my university and the, which synthesize uh, national research with my own chronic pain experience uh, to get, give guidelines for what the WHO has recognized as a global mental health epidemic. Uh, mm -hmm. And the second most recent one is about the Black Death and COVID and what we can learn about what the aftermath of COVID will be like looking at the Black Death answer, it's more complicated than most of the short op-eds have been giving you, which is why my version is a 10,000 word blog post. Uh, as for Exoterra, the current game uh, where the students are creating a terraformed exoplanet, you can find that at voices.u, that's the letter u, chicago.edu slash exoterra. So voices.uchicago.edu slash exoterra. So if you email me, I will, of course, point you at anything you like. And my email is available on adapalmer.com. Twitter is ada underscore palmer. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, it's such a pleasure to continue the conversation. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been an honor. Thank you for having us.